Hey everybody, this is Alex and Ben. Welcome back to the Oregon Bridge. The point is, it just feels like our way of life is under attack. And I think it was absolutely wrong to censor the president. But what I'm honestly more concerned about is the censoring of conservatives in general, not only censoring the president, but censoring a whole side of politics. Whether you love Trump or hate Trump, I think he's brought a lot of great new candidates to the forefront. The problem is they feel like they're being persecuted by people in the cities. And of course, that means Democrats. So it's really just a lack of understanding of the other side. All right, everybody. Thanks again for, for joining us today. We have a really exciting episode in store. We have Alex Scarlatos, who's joining us today. And uh, Alec is such an interesting guy because uh, before he ran for Congress against Peter DeFazio, a lot of you probably already knew who he was because he's an international celebrity. And I, I think Alec is so funny because he's, he's such a huge name, but he seems like such a humble uh, and maybe even a little bit of a shy guy. But uh, he served in Afghanistan, uh, he served in the military, and he stopped a terrorist attack on a train. Uh, he got the Soldier's Medal from President Obama. He was awarded France's highest medal. He was on Dancing of the Stars with Lindsay Arnold, and he even starred himself in a movie by Clint Eastwood. So Ben Alec is a, a fascinating guy and has done a lot of things for being only 28. Yes, yes, he has. Um, and he he represents an interesting milestone for the Republican Party in Oregon, um, he ran against Peter DeFazio for Congress in 2020, and he literally came closer to winning than any other Republican candidate since Congressman DeFazio has been running in, in 1986 when he first got elected. Um, so a welcome change, I imagine, for Republicans to see someone, uh, he, he earned 46% of the vote to Congressman DeFazio's 51.5%, uh, which for the record is far better than uh, Mr. Art Robinson's 10 years of competing against Congressman DeFazio. Yeah, and one of the most uh, interesting things about Alec, I think, besides that he is sort of the ideal candidate that we should be running in Oregon all of the time, someone who's professional, someone who raised a lot of money, was able to get national recognition, he was on Fox News all of the time. Alec clearly did really well for himself, especially this being only the second time he's, he's run for office before. But Ben, one of the things I really think that the listeners uh, should hone in on, and one of the most interesting things I thought from the podcast was... Alex sort of framed that the future of the Republican Party, at least in Oregon, should be towards more of a libertarian bent. Now, for viewers who've been following politics at the national level, uh, that's sort of the opposite that we've seen the GOP go in terms of issues, right? We had President Trump call for $2,000 stimulus checks. Uh, he almost uh, basically crashed the last stimulus bill because Congress didn't end up putting that much money in. Uh, we have folks like Tom Cotton, Senator Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley that are calling for strict immigration policies questioning free trade, questioning so-called fiscal responsibility, and those sort of traditional Republican talking points that you might see when Mitt Romney was running for president. So I'm curious, Ben, what do you sort of think of that? What did you get out of that with him? Because it just sort of seems like at least what, what Alec was saying, that kind of goes against where national trends are looking like for the Republican Party at this point. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. I mean, we are going to talk about a lot on this show the evolution of the Republican Party in the Trump era. It certainly doesn't look like the party that it looked like when John McCain was the standard bearer, for example, in 2008. Um, and there's different ways that that young and ambitious political figures are dealing with the realignment of the Republican Party. And um, you know, some folks are trying to basically ignore the four years of, of Trumpism and go back to the way it was before. Um, I don't think that's what Alec is, is trying to do. I think Alec himself is personally more libertarian and believes in a smaller government. Um, but also he, he made some concessions in, in the podcast about how um, he understands that that's not always the most popular um, policy proposal, um, a libertarian policy proposal. So we talk a little bit about stimulus checks and I think that'll be interesting for folks to, to listen in on. Um, but I'm curious what your take was. What, what was the secret sauce that made Alec so much more competitive than all the other, you know, dozen candidates that have challenged Congressman DeFazio? Yeah, well, I think what's 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 great about Alec, obviously, he has a very impressive resume, but uh, he's also just a normal guy. You know, when he answers questions, there's not some soliloquy about, oh, well, I have to defend my principles and values to uphold the standards <laughs> for all our good. He actually just talks like a normal person. Uh, which I think is what a lot of people are looking for out of politicians right now, right? I mean, that was one of the big galls for someone like Trump, right? Is he says it how he says it, and that's why I like him. I've talked to so many voters who have said that before. Uh, of course, Alec is a much more toned down version of Trump, I would say. He's a pretty calm, 
calm guy. Uh, but I mean, well, I think he just him. He's actually like the opposite of Trump. And I mentioned this in the pot, like Alec is like mild mannered and quiet and very respectful. And like, you can see this in all of his TV interviews. He he's the sort of anti-Trump by demeanor. You know, he's ve- like, you know, very polite. Um, none of the sort of bombast of Donald Trump. So I think that's another interesting dynamic here is someone who uh, ran on the same ticket as Donald Trump and, and very much um, put his arms around Trump in terms of the campaign that he ran. Um, but uh, in practice and in um, by demeanor is just very much the opposite. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other thing is Alec is, is clearly a real serious guy and someone that people should be following uh, to look at what he's going to do next. I mean, he was also able to get some pretty major endorsements in his race from folks like Ted Cruz, from folks like Kevin McCarthy. So clearly people at the national level are paying attention to Alec. Uh, so folks in Oregon should definitely be paying attention to him too in terms of what his next moves are. But yeah. uh, we hope that you guys... Enjoy the episode. Uh, Make sure to give us five stars. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Of course, who wouldn't want to miss this back and forth between Ben and I? Uh, We know you're only two episodes in, so hopefully it will continue to be as good as it has already been. But uh, thank you guys so much for for tuning in, and we hope that you enjoyed the pod. All right. Well, Alec, thank you for for jumping on the podcast with us. And we want to start just by acknowledging that it's been a crazy couple of weeks. This is just before the inauguration uh, is going to take place. And I know for me, I was I was watching what was happening on the sixth, whether you call it a riot or an insurrection or a coup, and it was it was hard to watch as someone who's been involved in and passionate about politics for a long time. There were tears shed, uh, there was angry moments, and I'm just curious from from your perspective as someone who served in the army and who was a, a top tier political candidate. Like, what have, what have you been thinking over the last couple of weeks? Where's your head been at? Uh, I'm just thinking that we're getting very divided as a country. I mean, it's something that no one wants to see, but I mean, we've had the BLM riots over the summer for months, the Chaz and the Red House Autonomous Zone in Portland. And then we had, I guess, storming of the Capitol on the 6th. And, you know, it's just, it's a shame that we're going down this road as a country. And I think we really need to figure out if this is what we really want to do. And I can, I can even deal with the divisiveness, to be honest, but now big tech is kind of using this as an excuse to censor conservatives. And that's something I very much disagree with because no matter what side you're on, whether you think it's polarized or not, or, you know, how divisive speech can be, it still needs to be free speech. And unfortunately stifling one side does not really help their side of the argument whatsoever. That's a fascinating response. And I'm curious about the stifling of free speech issue. So do you, A, do you think it was a mistake for Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, to kind of mute or remove the president's account, President Trump's accounts? And B, do you think there is a line that exists where Trump or any political figure could cross where they would sort of revoke their right to participate in the the digital public square? So, I mean, I think it was absolutely wrong to censor the president. I mean, (laughs) he's still the president of the United States. I mean, that's ridiculous. But what I'm honestly more concerned about is the censoring of conservatives in general, conservatives that didn't even speak out about violence or anything whatsoever. And that's what's really scary is not only censoring the president, but censoring a whole side of politics. And that's what I find to be frightening. And honestly, no, I don't think there should be a line that needs to be crossed. I mean, if there is a line that's crossed, it's going to be handled legally. We don't need social media companies to step in. I mean, the whole premise is that they're supposed to be an open public square. The second they start censoring certain sides of an argument is when they, you know, kind of remove their, uh, what is it, section 230 or whatever it's called, rights to be protected. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's on them, but I mean, they're probably going to lose their protections uh, based on what they've been doing. So I think this is fa- this is fascinating to me because this is where I think folks see things differently depending on where they're approaching the political question. So like folks on the left, and I'll put myself in this category, see what President Trump did with his platform as inciting what we have what we saw happen on January sixth, and maybe you could make the argument that that isn't what happened and that isn't what he was intending to do. But let's say that there was a political figure who was using a social media platform to literally combat the institutions of government or to, to, um, 
you know, so in the example of, of uh, what we saw happen with on January 6th, like, what if there was a political figure who was actively saying to their followers, like, we need to disrupt this from happening, you know, the election was stolen, it's up to us to storm the Capitol, like, in, a, in an extreme situation like that, which we can, let's say that that isn't what happened with President Trump, you would, your argument would essentially be, it would be up to the courts and legislative branches to regulate that speech and not the platform itself. Absolutely. I mean, it's sedition is sedition. You could try someone for treason for that. I mean, you don't need Twitter to shut their account down if they're going to get arrested and spend the rest of their life in prison. And I think what really makes conservatives angry is that Twitter doesn't do that. They only do that to President Trump. I mean, we still have the Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of Iran and North Korea on Twitter. I mean, people that are doing horrible, horrible things, much worse than what President Trump is doing. But of course, it's only conservative pundits and President Trump that are being censored. They're not applying those rules evenly. And even if they were applying those rules evenly, they would still revoke their Title 230 protections or whatever it's called. I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of out of politics lately, so I'm not sure no, on no. all the terms, but you get what I'm saying. Totally. And Titus, I'm curious about your your take on this since you spent some time in DC and you were in Trump world. Like, How does that section of the political landscape view social media and censorship right now? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting issue because you sort of have the side that Alec is presenting in terms of, you know, it's bad that these tech companies are censoring conservatives. Uh, these are supposed to be free and open platforms. I also personally think it's ridiculous that no matter what the president says that he's not allowed on, you know, one of the biggest platforms basically where people can collect information from him. I mean, I think it was ridiculous that Twitter, you know, went ahead and banned him, but you have this divide amongst Republicans where you have this sort of more free market side, uh, which says, no, Twitter is a private company. They're allowed to have whoever on their platform that they please. Uh, if they want to ban anyone, me, you, Alec, the president of the United States, whoever, they absolutely have the right to do that. And especially in, in Trump world, you have sort of the, the Alec view, view of it, whereas with kind of the, the free market tiers, as they call themselves in DC, the folks who basically support, you know, more of the free market side of things, they're much more on the side of saying, oh yeah, Twitter, Twitter can totally be able to do that. But Ben, I'm actually really curious of your perspective on this as well from a progressive, because I think Alec makes a really interesting case for this, but I've also actually heard uh, the similar side from, from progressives who basically want to crack down on big tech in terms of, you know, they're allowing some of these groups that basically want to come onto the platform, they're promoting violence on it or whatever, we need to crack down on these big companies because they're allowing people to speak on them. So it's obviously not the same political issue, but I mean, what are, what are progressives thinking about this, especially progressives in Orkin? Well, I mean, for, for me, the way that I process and think about what happened is like, so there's, there's the sort of like written rules of the game. And then there's been the unwritten rules of American politics, the norms, the institute, the, the, the things that like aren't illegal. Like you could, you could probably make an argument that what Donald Trump did and said leading up to the sixth wasn't illegal, but it was sort of unprecedented in modern American history to have a president who lost the election, like, you know, uh, refused to acknowledge that. And in fact, Stoke, beliefs that like that wasn't the case at all and that there was like hundreds of thousands of people whose ballots got thrown out or illegal votes etc so like in some ways the institutions that we want and hope to um to kind of regulate and promote the peaceful transfer of power didn't work like there's nothing stopping that to the point where we literally had an armed insurrection at our united states capitol and so twitter and facebook stepped into that void to prevent to in, in what I think is prevent further damage from happening. Like it's been a quiet week <laughs> without Trump on social media. And uh, I don't know what the, the progressive take on it is. I think we certainly need greater regulation. I think there might actually be some overlap between where Alec approaches this and where progressives approach this. But in this case, I think like, I would, I would obviously support strongly the removal of someone who's like using his platform to, to destroy American institutions. But Anyway, well, you say that till it happens to your side. I mean, what if they, uh, what if Twitter existed back in 2000 and Al Gore was complaining about the election being stolen from him? And what if Twitter decided that that was sedition and then they shut down Al Gore's Twitter account and everybody that was speaking out in favor of Al Gore? I mean, that's the problem is that people are okay with it until it happens to them. And we need to kind of step up and draw a line in the sand and say, no matter who this is happening to, it's wrong. And I mean, 
to your point, I think that social media companies are free. There are, there are their own independent organization. They have a right to censor, but the problem really is that they've become a monopoly and there is no alternative for Twitter. And, you know, you could say there's now things popping up like Parler and whatnot, but then they even shut down Parler in the app store and the Google store. So when you have these big tech companies colluding to quite literally shut out the competition and create a monopoly, I think they lose that right of just claiming, oh, we're a free market company. We can do whatever we want. So I think that that's, I I think, again, there's places we agree because you said we should draw a line, but your line is that we shouldn't censor anyone ever. And my line is we should apply the same standards to both sides. So like Al Gore complaining is not the same as lies that are, have been proven not true, that courts have struck down, that like all the legal challenges have proven to be false. Like that's different from someone saying- um, I agree. I'm just saying it's a slippery slope. Once you allow it to happen to President Trump, what if it happens to the other side for something doing a lot less? I mean, like I said, they haven't censored a lot of these other social media accounts or liberal accounts calling for the president to be killed and things like that. They're not censoring those accounts, but they're censoring conservatives for doing much less. And see, that's That's why we, we should agree there. Like if there's accounts that are like threatening death or threatening assassination of figures on the right, shut it down. Like that should be a bright line that if we pass, like you can call it censorship or you can call it protecting people. Like we shouldn't allow that to happen on the platforms. I would just include in the category of things that shouldn't be allowed um, inciting insurrection, uh, which anyway, Titus final word before we move on to the next question. Yeah, I think it's, uh, well, I think even in this 11 minutes we've had so far, we may have a Bowman Scarlatos, uh, uh, big tech platform to put forward. That's bipartisan. So <laughs> it looks like, it looks like we figured it out in about 11 minutes, which is it good. Won't be, so. It won't be parlor. I promise. Uh, <laughs> so, so Alec, one of the things we wanted to talk to you about is like being a Republican in Oregon. And so Oregon, you know, since the 80s has not elected a Republican governor. There's been one Republican member of the congressional delegation for 25 years, um, probably before. How old are you, Alec? 28. 20, okay, so you and I are the same age. So yeah. when we were tiny little ones in the cradle, there was a, there were two Republicans in the congressional delegation. But since then, it's been all blue. And... In some other states like Massachusetts and Maryland and in Illinois for a bit, there were examples of red in Vermont. Now there are examples of Republican figures succeeding in blue states. And you are someone who the sort of national level GOP identified as as a kid, you know, like us, like we're young, we're, we're navigating this. And you were like top tier. You were identified as the best shot that the Republicans had. And in fact, and we'll talk about this more later, but you came closer to beating a, you know, essentially a 30 year incumbent than anyone has in his entire congressional career. So what do you make of the state of the Oregon Republican Party, like its inability to win elections and the fact that you as a newcomer came closer in a competitive race than than anyone has in a long time? Like what what's the thesis for what's gone wrong? Uh, Well, the Oregon GOP is very fractured and just not very well organized, to be honest. Um, And there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, to be honest, part of the reason is just we haven't won anything in a long, long time and Republicans get beaten down after a certain amount of time. I mean, the uh, Democrats control, control the state legislature, so they're allowed to draw you know, lines and basically gerrymander. I'm not saying that's necessarily an excuse, but we, we gave this a really good shot and we came incredibly close. But if you look at where some of the district lines are drawn, it's definitely a little suspicious and I'm hoping since this is a redistricting year, that the Democrats basically draw the lines in a way that there's at least two Republican congressional districts in Oregon, because right now there's two competitive ones that could go either way. And I think that if Peter DeFazio was not an incumbent, we probably would have been able to win. But the incumbency does bring a lot of uh, name ID advantage and a lot of financial advantage when it comes to raising money from PACs. But you know, what can you do? That's the uh, system that we have. And um, I I do think Republicans need to do much better job in Oregon. And um, I think we're probably still a ways away from winning statewide seats, but there are some congressional seats, specifically the fourth and the fifth, that Republicans should be giving the Democrats a run for their money every election. So Alec, I wanna dive 
a little bit a little bit more into that too because sort of the the which i think is completely wrong the kind of status quo conventional wisdom in oregon at least with a lot of the republicans i've dealt with are you know this is a crazy blue state we can never win in oregon because it's too liberal now if you look at states as ben was saying before like maryland right i mean maryland has a three to it's either a two to one or three to one democrat versus republican registration and larry hogan who of course is is, is anti-Trump. So maybe that would have run into issues if he would have run today. But I mean, he won overhandedly in, in 2014. He won re-election again. It wasn't even basically a competitive race this time. What do you think are the issues basically? And by no means is the, I mean, Maryland only has one Republican too, who appears in their, their congressional delegation, who's a Republican. What do you think some of the specific issues are? Like when you talk about in-party fighting, what does that actually look like in practice? Like I mean, you are our top tier guy. I also agree with you. I think if it was an open seat, uh, we probably would have Congressman Scarlatos right now, which would be awesome. But what do you think, you know, what does that sort of infighting look like? And how does that, you know, how does that impact you as a candidate? Uh, I just think that it's the fact that people can't get organized in primaries and Republicans like to stand on principle a lot of times and Democrats just want to win elections. And sometimes I wish Republicans were a little bit more like Democrats in that we just wanted to win elections. Because sometimes if you're a Republican, I mean, even in Oregon, where we really can't afford to be picky, if there's one thing wrong with you, whether they think you're too moderate or too libertarian on any one issue, Republicans will basically crucify you for it and then not turn out to vote. Not saying that happened to me, but I've seen that happen countless times in other races. And then on the other side of the coin, um, really conservative Republicans can't win in Oregon because they can't win over the moderates. I think I did so well because I consider myself more of a libertarian. I don't really care about social issues. And I think really on the West Coast or really West of the Rockies, uh, that's kind of the future for Republicans. You kind of have to be a little bit more libertarian, not moderate necessarily. I mean, I still love President Trump. I think he did a great job. But you have to be a little bit more libertarian leaning on social issues. I mean, especially in Oregon, people like their guns and their weed. So um, it's it's not really a Democrat or Republican state, at least in the Southwestern part of the state where I am. I mean, everybody, it seems is libertarian, whether they know it or not, most of them are. So that, this is fascinating to me because um, it's, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised, but it still is interesting to hear you basically say that you like President Trump, because when I have, like, I watched a bunch of your videos and listened to your interviews, you're very polite, you're mild mannered, you're sort of soft-spoken. You, there's this great clip on, uh, I think it was KGW was interviewing you and they're like, do you disavow Proud Boys and QAnon? And you were like, yeah, I dis like what? <laughs> like, it was like obvious. And um, like your political instincts seem very counter to the president's, which is basically like double down, be, you know, sort of angry or loud. Like it doesn't come across when, when you speak. So I'm curious, like, how does that translate to what you imagine for a political future for Republicans in Oregon? Like, is it adopting sort of Trumpian policies without the sort of Trumpian affect? Like, how do you think about it? I would say something along those lines. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I agree with a lot of the things that President Trump did. It's like, of course, we wish he would have been a little bit more polite on some things. Um, but at the same time, that's kind of what got him elected and made him stand out from the crowd of boring uh, career politicians in the 2016 primary. But Um, I would say I'm more libertarian. I think Trump was more of a traditional big government Republican, not even necessarily conservative. So I think we disagreed probably on a lot of things when it came to the size and scale of government. But I would say for a big government conservative, I would agree with a lot of his decisions, especially on things like foreign policy, trade, taxes. I mean, again, I would probably align myself politically with more of a libertarian, like uh, Thomas Massey is probably one of my favorite congressmen. Hmm. But I mean, I do agree with a lot of things President Trump did. And I mean, he, he did what he got elected to do. And I think that's better than most of the more moderate or traditional Republican candidates we've had the last 20, 30 years. Let me ask you one case, like case study question. So I think this part of my thesis on why Trump was so successful was an embrace of economic populism, which is very much like the opposite of libertarianism. And so like the case study where I, I would, I'm curious where you fall. Trump at, I was arguably too late, but Trump starts advocating for $2,000 checks for everybody. 
And it ends up being Mitch McConnell and congressional Republicans who shut that down. If you're a vote in Congress, do you vocally support $2,000 stimulus checks or do you kind of revert back to the libertarianism and say, you know, we don't need that right now? Well, see, that's the problem <laughs> is there's these different, you know, I mean, it's in both parties. I mean, the Democrats have the progressives, the Republicans, I guess you would say have the libertarians or whatever. But the point is, is that in, in principle and in theory, I would be against $2,000 checks for everyone because it's going to raise the national debt by a huge amount and really, I guess, increase inflation and things like that. But at the same time, I would much rather vote for $2,000 checks for everyone as opposed to sending that same amount of money to larger companies in the form of like a 2008 style tarp bailout, things like See, there's, that. There's the coalition. That's the coalition. Alex exactly. and, and the progressive <laughs> left like are aligned there. Don't, don't say that publicly. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that's just, it's just, it's more of a compromise. It's like, no, I don't agree in bailouts, but if we are going to have a bailouts and both parties want a bailout, let's at least make sure it goes to actual people, not just big corporations. So, so Alec, I, I think that that's really interesting. And I want to jump in on something you said earlier with the libertarian versus the big government Republicans. Something that I think is is interesting in, in Oregon specifically is you can be a libertarian on some issues, right? You could believe in, I don't know, let's, if the libertarian position is actually pro-choice, let's say you're pro-choice, pro-decriminalization of drugs, you're pro-gay marriage, all of that sort of stuff. But you could also be big government in the sense of, you, you know, you could advocate for raising taxes on the rich. You could advocate for more spending. You could advocate for more social security. And I think President Trump, the candidate in 2016, wasn't advocating for all of those things, but he was advocating for some of them, right? Like he basically threw away the social issues, said, you know, I'm the most pro-life president ever, but really didn't talk about that. That wasn't his main focus. He was the only candidate on stage that said, I refuse to cut social security spending. Uh, and he also basically said, absolutely not. We're not touching Medicare. I'm curious of that sort of economic populist model that Ben was talking about and, and kind of what the president actually ran on. Do you think that would be a more effective sort of agenda than I would say, kind of like the generic small government, you know, we're fighting for liberty, we're fighting for lower taxes in some of those more competitive districts, let's say where Kurt Schrader's running or maybe even breaking into some of those Portland districts. Do you think that that could be a good path forward for the Oregon Republican Party? Or would you advocate if someone was running in one of those districts, they may want to consider a platform like that? Uh, yes, but at the same time, I don't necessarily think it's right. I mean, we uh, not necessarily with social security, but I mean, there are a lot of places that we need to cut. You can be a Republican and still be a big government Republican on certain issues or a libertarian on other issues. But there's the fact of populism and doing things, I guess, to get elected and then what's actually right for the country. Just because everybody wants a $2,000 check doesn't mean it's actually healthy for the country and doesn't mean it's necessarily the right direction. I mean, that's why we have a republic, not a straight up democracy. So, I mean, yes and no, I guess, to answer your question. I mean, there are certain issues that I think Republicans need to change their outlook on in order to actually win elections. And then there's other issues that I think we should not compromise on, because then what's the difference between Republicans and, say, a very just moderate independent candidate or even a lightweight Democrat? Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think I think that makes sense, Alec. And one thing I'm, I'm really interested in your perspective on is where are the other Alex in Oregon? And I'll, I'll kind of key up, key up what I mean by that. When I was in DC, people were always so fascinated in Oregon because they see it as basically this hyper blue state, but they also know that we have two of the most competitive house districts in the country. I think they're actually, both of them are in the top 10. We had the district that you ran in against DeFazio, and then we also have Kurt Schrader, which I believe is basically a 50-50 split uh, district down, down the line, there's no registration advantage for either party. Now, if you look at someone like you, you ran an incredible campaign, right? I mean, you raised $5 million, you had major endorsements, you had a really compelling story to basically tell. I thought you had a really compelling agenda specifically for the people in that district too. So I'm curious of where are the other Alex? Like, why can't, you know, why don't we have a really serious candidate run against Kurt Schrader every time? Or Our Robinson really for 10 serious... years. Our Robinson was the candidate for 10 years in Eugene. Yeah, and I mean, he spent a lot of money in a couple of his races too, right? And it made no difference. So Alec, I'm really curious of, you know, that's kind of my question. Where are the other Alex in Oregon? Like, have you met 
any of these rising stars? Is there anyone that you should look for in particular? Like, why can't we make these competitive candidates each time around like other states can? A couple of reasons. There are a couple other candidates that I would say um, to look forward uh, to in the future. But I think the biggest problem is the Republicans have no structure in Oregon, which is both a good and a bad thing. In the primary, we were able to make a lot happen, but that was simply because we knew what we were doing, not me, but my team, really. And there's other candidates that might be great candidates that just don't have the support or the infrastructure that I have. And so a lot of times they get beaten out by a more conservative or a more experienced politician and they win the primary and then they lose hard to the Democrat, like what happened with Art Robinson. I mean, he was probably a great candidate if he was running in Texas or Or for the Oregon or or something like that. He's now an Oregon State Senator. Exactly. (laughs) But you see my point. I mean, he's a yeah. great conservative candidate. Like he would be, if, if it was a heavy Republican district, you know, he'd be the congressman. But the fact is that he was basically too conservative to run in a competitive district. And I'm not saying you necessarily need to be moderate, but you have to kind of pick and choose your issues and pick and choose how you say things when you're in a general election. And um, there's a little bit of politics that goes into that. And we need candidates that are politically smart and that have the right kind of track record, but are also, you know, young enough to kind of bring a different kind of energy. I mean, I think that whether you love Trump or hate Trump, I think he's brought a lot of great new candidates to the forefront. I mean, if you look at the congressional, um, not necessarily the class, but the, the type of candidates that ran in 2020 across the country, I mean, there was awesome candidates. There was diverse candidates. I mean, we had, Burgess Owens in Utah four, Madison Cawthorn in North Carolina, whatever that was, 17 or seven or something like that. Uh, Sean Parnell in uh, Pennsylvania, 17, I think is what it was. And then, um, I mean, just he's brought a younger, more diverse Republican party. And I think that that's kind of what we need to embrace. Whether you love Trump or hate Trump, you do need to look at what the Republican party was in 2008, 2012, and realize that where the path that we're on now is the correct path. We just maybe need to alter a few things. And of course, in places like Oregon, find the right candidates that maybe don't care so much about social issues, but want to on fiscal issues, especially um, because especially being a young person, I mean, seeing where the national debt's going and everything like that, it's very scary. I mean, we talked about divisiveness earlier, but I mean, I think the national debt is a probably much more pressing and larger problem overall to our health as a country. So, so, but well, specifically on that issue, Alec, especially in in your district, right, which I went, or the district you ran in, which I went to school in Eugene. Eugene, obviously a very uh, liberal area. There's lots of students there. Uh, There was protests all all of the time, but of course the surrounding area is, is very rural. Uh, And I know that's something we want to get to a little bit later too, but uh, do you actually think, because I, I think that, at least from, from experience and with some of these races, that things like being pro-life, they really get those sorts of voters excited, right? Like, like the rural folks. And one of the things I think we saw this was, was when Monica Webby ran for Senate in 2014. I mean, she was seen as a very high profile candidate. She had a national profile, but she was pro-choice. And I think that that really ended up killing her in the race. I mean, she lost to Jeff Merkley by 19 points, which I was actually looking today that Joe Ray Perkins, who ran against Jeff Merkley and who didn't raise any money. And I think her first tweet as a candidate was something about QAnon, uh, which maybe was why you had to disavow it in that interview. Even she got a higher percentage than Monica Webby. She, Is she that right? went about, yeah, she went about three or four points higher. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm curious though, you know, when you talk about issues like fiscal conservatism versus, versus pro-life is when you're running a district like that, I mean, you know, what was sort of the defining issue that you chose to get people excited? Because clearly you did get a lot of people excited. I mean, you ran much higher numbers than our Robinson did. You know, what were you talking about with people that really got them excited? I, I mean, we chose issues that people cared about. I mean, I'm just as pro-life probably as Art Robinson or at least close to it. But at the same time, you don't want to run on issues that are going to alienate moderates you want to run. I mean, there's a difference between agreeing with something and running on it, obviously. We ran on issues like forest management, the economy as a whole, which keep in mind, the fourth congressional district is the poorest in Oregon. 
and we used that used to not be true. I mean, I'm not campaigning anymore, but to be fair, Peter DeFazio inherited a district that was very wealthy and doing well for itself and basically ran it into the ground. Obviously not just Peter DeFazio, we have a lot of people to thank for that, but timber policy in Southwestern Oregon is very broken. We have huge forest fires. People aren't even allowed to salvage log, which is actually good for the environment. I mean, it really makes no sense, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. If you actually look into the issue, I really couldn't understand why something hadn't been done on it for the life of me. And it's a federal issue, unfortunately. So there's not anything we can do on the state level or county level, really. But I mean, like I said, we forest congressional district, forest management issues. Um, we also are very elderly congressional district. So healthcare was very important for us as well. Um, and those were kind of the issues that we ran on, just what people actually cared about, not, you know, buzzwords for either side of the aisle, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong, we definitely had to talk about certain national issues to nationalize the race. But when it came down to what the issues I actually cared about and the issues we were actually running on and talking to people in the fourth congressional about is very local issues. And that's really what people care about. I mean, even though you're running a federal race, people want to do well. They want lower taxes in their congressional district. They want their forest to not burn down every year. I mean, it's things that issues that hit close to home are what people are going to vote on. That's it. that's fascinating to hear you say. I, I actually think my take on the outcome is different than yours. And I'll out myself as a, as a big supporter of, of Congressman DeFazio. I interned on his campaign way back when I was in school. And I think DeFazio in some ways is like a uniquely Oregon Democrat. Like, I don't think he fits the mold of the type of candidate who your campaign would have been even more effective against because, you know, he's got this long history in the district, but it's not as like, I don't think people see him as, you know, career politician. They see him as the guy who drove the beat up Dodge Dart around the district and the guy who Obama got pissed at because he voted against Obama's bailout. You know, he started the the progressive caucus like before, well before AOC and the squad was in, was in Congress. He was like perceived as the, the populist Democrat. So I think like, and now, you know, he's like chair of transportation and gonna you know has a big role in infrastructure you know the nra he used to get attacked from the left because the uh they they said that he was like too obsessed with nra orthodoxy so i feel like in some ways peter defazio is this like uniquely oregon figure who your your sort of attacks against didn't land because people were like oh but he's the guy you know he's been there he, he's our guy he's peter defazio he drives the dodge dart so I wonder, like, and, and Titus alluded to this, like, if, if it was an open seat, you may have won. Do you think running against someone like DeFazio was more challenging because of the, the, the like, place in politics he's carved out? Um, or did you really just perceive him as a long-term incumbent and I'm just going to run against him as a long-term incumbent? Um, I don't know, both, I guess. <laughs> I mean, look, Peter DeFazio, he used to be very much, I guess you would say like a moderate or even middle of the road type Democrat, even though he did found the progressive party caucus with Bernie Sanders, he had that reputation. And I think that was part of what helped him. But I mean, honestly, the fact of the matter is last five, six years, he has gone incredibly far left. He is no longer that candidate that you're describing. I mean, he used to in the mid to late nineties have a, as high as a B plus rating from the NRA. And now I think he's at a D minus or something like that. So it's not, I think that his reputation as that candidate definitely helped him in this race. But of course, you don't exactly run a campaign on the similarities between you and the incumbent. You run on the differences. Right, totally. And fortunately for us, his record was very far left in the last few years. So that's, what, of course, we hit him on. Well, it's interesting. Like, I think it comes down to like, what does far left mean? It gets, you know, what we talked about earlier, which is if economic populism is far left, then yeah, like Peter DeFazio is far left. I think he's one of the most economically populist figures in Congress. Like voting against the Obama stimulus because it was too pro corporation was like a very bold, bold move for the congressman to make. And I think it was a precursor to what we see now with like the, the rise of Bernie Sanders in, in the party. Like Peter DeFazio understood something about economic unrest and economic unfairness. And I think like, whether that makes him far left or whether that makes him more in touch with working people or both, which is possible, I think is an interesting question, but it kind of, it kind of transitions us to 
the last thing we want to talk to you about, which is the urban rural divide. Titus, you, you heard an interview that you wanted to ask Alec about. Yeah. And, and just, just, just for the viewers, Ben. So, uh, so of course our, our thesis basically is that national trends and national politics have really overtaken local issues in a way. And I, really see this urban rural divide. I mean, we've heard about this across the country. It was, you know, basically helped with the rise of Donald Trump. And what we mean by the urban rural divide is basically that there is a growing divide between people who live in urban areas and people who live in rural areas. We've seen rural areas continue to shrink economically from a population perspective. We've seen higher rates of crime, higher rates of drug use. I mean, the opioid crisis has really ravaged a lot of rural communities. And you know, you read about this sort of thing in newspapers and in books, and you don't really know what it's like until, uh, I, I remember an example of someone that I met at a conference once and they told me, and they lived uh, somewhere very far out in, in Eastern rural Oregon. And they told me basically that when you called 911, it would take three hours for an ambulance to show up or three hours for a police officer to show up. You can imagine, of course, if someone is violently breaking into your house and trying to assault you or trying to kill you or something like that. I mean, you know, three hours basically for a police officer to show up, like, even basic services like that, that we take so for granted in, in urban areas. I mean, that's just, that's not the case in some rural areas. So Alec, I, I read this quote, which I thought was, was really interesting and really plays into this sort of urban rural divide from this OPB article. And uh, I'm just quoting what the reporter said. They said, quote, in many ways, Scarlatos and DeFazio were talking to two very different constituencies in the fourth congressional district, which Trump lost by only a 10th of a percentage point in 2016. So to me, that just sounded so interesting because, of course, you're both running to represent the same set of voters. It doesn't matter if you win or if DeFazio would have won. You're, you know, th those are your representatives, everyone that's in that district. What, what do they mean when it says you're, you're running for two different, you know, two very different constituencies? What does that actually look like? Well, I mean, Peter DeFazio, for all intents and purposes, is the congressman from Eugene and Corvallis, and I I guess in theory would have been the congressman from everywhere else in the fourth. I mean, that's just how it is. And what's unfortunate really is that people in rural areas, like you said, have had a very tough time. We are now the poorest congressional district in the state. I mean, we used to have the richest school district um, in Oregon and I think even up there in the country. And now we're, we can barely afford to pay sheriff's departments. I mean, the problem is, is it feels like in Oregon and states that have, you know, massive rural Republican areas, they feel like they're being persecuted by people in the cities. And of course, that means Democrats, simply because, I mean, Democrats, they want to do things like ban guns. And they don't understand that from someone living in the middle of rural Oregon, that it might take an hour and a half for them to get a police officer to their house, and they kind of needed a gun for protection, whereas that isn't the case. So it's really just a lack of understanding of the other side. And I'm sure that you could say the same thing about Republicans and people in the cities, but the point is it just feels like our way of life is under attack. I mean, we're not allowed to harvest trees, which is really the whole purpose towns in Southwestern Oregon were established. And now we're not even allowed to cut trees down after they burn when they're gonna die anyway. And there's things like that that are these laws that are put in place by the Democrats in the population centers because they have the population and the vote that they don't really have to compromise and they don't really have to appeal to the urban voter. I mean, that's why I think it was Coos Bay that traditionally went Democrat, went Republican in mm -hmm. 16. They're losing a lot of those more rural areas because those more rural blue dog type Democrats those more moderate Democrats are now realizing that the Democrat party simply doesn't represent me anymore. They are no longer okay with me owning a gun. They are no longer okay with my way of life or what I do for a living. And that's, I think, the real problem is that both sides of the aisle are really catering to their voter base more and more and more and not really reaching out for those people in the middle or the people that, you know, think that, you know, I consider myself a moderate, you know, um, so I think... I, I want to ask you about, there's a lot, there's a lot there that I think is worthy of unpacking, but the, the tim you, you ran on a timber economy, basically. That was, a big, that was a big part of your congressional campaign. And I think, and I'm sure voters, particularly you know, in Roseburg and the more rural parts of your community, they want to hear that we're going to go back to the timber economy of the 70s and 80s, where these cities were booming, school districts were flooded with money, counties had tons of money. But my opinion is that 
like we're not those days are they're gone and they're gone a because of regulation from the government for sure but they're also gone because of technological innovation that has made cutting down and processing trees way more efficient it takes way fewer people to do it so you see some of these places with unemployment rates of north of 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 percent salvage harvesting is not going to is not going to bring back those economies and in fact we either need a replacement we need an economic replacement to to create a, a economic engine like timber used to um, or we need to think of something else and you know Andrew Yang would say that it's it's universal basic income that's the way that you transition economies but a do you agree that like the timber economies of Oregon's yesteryear are gone or do you think there is a path to that level of economic activity being generated from timber and if not what's the alternative well I guess I would say that I don't think you're necessarily wrong 100%, but I would say I disagree with you on a few points. Okay. If the timber economy, even though it does not employ as many people as it would in the 70s and 80s, if it doubled in size, that would still mean double the employees. Sure. Um, and so whether it's the cure for all of our economic woes is, one, is up for debate, absolutely, but it would definitely help. And not to mention all the tertiary industries that are still necessary, like you still need truck drivers to drive trucks. But regardless, the real problem is that our tax base in Southwestern Oregon and actually all of Western Oregon is based on timber harvest. There is no replacement for that. So I don't really care if the timber industry doesn't employ as many people, as long as they're still cutting trees, that means that that money is going to come into county government and to school districts and fire districts and things like that. I'm not really talking about it giving jobs to every single person in Southwestern Oregon. You're right, we do need to diversify economically, but that's not really the issue. That's really not what I was complaining about in my campaign. I was complaining about the fact that we couldn't fund sheriff's departments, schools, county services, and that problem would be solved by harvesting more trees. And I think we absolutely could go back to it. I mean, like I said, we need to find compromises and I think salvage logging should be the first compromise that we should be able to reach because, I mean, it is good both for the economy and for the environment. And I see no reason why we can't get that done. So, so Ben, I, I, w- I want to bring you in here because I think, I think what Alec mentioned earlier is really interesting is that there is, there's obviously a different policy divide, right? Like people in rural areas... They're more likely to support timber. They're more likely to want to own guns. They're probably more likely to support, you know, their pro-life and, and things like that. So there's definitely a, a policy divide in a way, uh, but there's also clearly a cultural divide, right? Uh, people in big cities like Portland uh, are just different than, than the people in rural areas, right? Like, you know, you could joke with the Portlandy episode. Uh, those are like two different people than, you know, are, are basically out, out in rural Oregon. They're like, they're, we're all Oregonians, but I mean, we're so differently from a cultural perspective there too. And I think Alec hit on that really nicely. And he also brings in a lot of, I think, actual policy solutions that people in these areas would support. So I'm, I'm really interested in your perspective because I know you've studied this issue as, as a progressive, let's say as a, as a rural, someone who would want a rural progressive agenda, what does that actually look like? Like, what is the counter to someone like Alec? Well, we've only got a couple minutes left before we gotta we gotta wrap up. But what I will say um, is, I do think a you you said cultural, not policy. I think policy is part of this. I do think that, for example, a lot of those folks whose whose local economies have been ravaged by lack of timber harvest would support two thousand dollar payment stimulus payments from the government. Um, I think a more activist government that looks out for poor people is part of the answer. In terms of culturally, like I actually think. And this will sound like a, a soft answer, but I do believe it. I think national service programs and even interstate service programs where you're sending young people, particularly high school students from rural Oregon into Portland and Salem and from the Willamette Valley into Eastern and Southern Oregon and, and facilitating interactions in that way. And we've got some clubs in the state and organizations that try to do that. I think we need to do it on a much larger scale. It should happen nationally, but the reality is like it should terrify us that a big chunk of Oregon's population wants to leave the state. Because like, and that's like that's yeah, they, real. they want they want to join Idaho, right? They want they want mistaken. Greater Idaho, which is Greater the, Idaho, yeah. But 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 that's certainly a topic for for further discussion. I think um, in closing, Alec, we wanted to to ask you just a couple 
couple of housekeeping items. One, if folks want to learn more about you or support you in your future work, where can they learn more or connect with you? And two, are you ready to announce your campaign in 2022 for Oregon's fourth congressional district right here? <laughs> uh, no, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, to be honest, I haven't ruled it out completely, but at the same time, we don't know what the, the new map is going to look like. I mean, the Democrats could gerrymander it quite a bit. Um, it's going to be hard for them to keep uh, if we do get another district, it's going to be very hard for them to keep five Democrat and only one Republican. So we'll see what happens there. So I'm not ruling it out. But um, if people want to, uh, I guess, learn more, I think our website is still active or they can reach out to uh, the campaign account on Facebook. But I don't think there'll be anybody to answer it right yet. Right yet. <laughs> Awesome. And then Alec, also uh, any, any, and Ben and I were, were talking about this and I have to put you on the spot for this. What are your thoughts of Scarlato's for governor? Right. I mean, people are talking, person, people are talking. The, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, right. Like Joe Biden just got elected. So Republicans are probably going to have a pretty good year in 2022. Uh, the only person to declare so far has been Bud Pierce who already lost an election for governor before you've clearly done a good job of being able to raise money and show that you actually have like a vision that I think a lot of Oregonians can agree with because you were in a really competitive district. Any thoughts of potentially running, running for governor or running for something that is in Congress? Uh, no, I mean, to be honest, like I, I wouldn't want that job. I mean, it's just uh, Oregon is still very difficult for a Republican to win statewide. And I don't think that even in 22, is the right time. I mean, I'm not saying it could never happen. And I know of some other decent candidates that are considering running for governor, and I would definitely support some of them. But I think we need to win one or two more congressional seats before we start looking at anything statewide, seriously. That makes sense. All right, Alec. Well, thank you for making the time to hop on the podcast with us. It's been a fascinating conversation and, and good luck to you. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it.